Okay, I think we'll get started. I'd like to welcome everybody this evening on behalf of the coalition who is sponsoring this forum. And the members of that coalition are the Tri-City Regional Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Pasco Chamber of Commerce, the West Richland Chamber of Commerce, the Associated Students of Columbia Basin College, the Tri-City Herald, Charter Communications, and the League of Women Voters of Benton and Franklin Counties. My name is Kay Autumn, and I am a member of the League of Women Voters. I need to say up front that the League does not oppose or support any candidate. We are nonpartisan. The League and the other members of the coalition I think it's important to provide opportunities for voters to learn about the candidates and so that's why we have put on these public forums. On this evening we're going to be hearing from candidates running for state legislative races from the 16th district and the 8th district. Um, we're going to follow this format, each candidate, they're going to come up two by two, as you can see, they're, we're ready to start. Um, each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement, and then we'll have question and answers, and they'll have up to two minutes for their answer, and then they'll have a minute and a half for a closing statement. Uh, the coalition has some prepared questions. But we have people with cards, and most of you have been given a card. If you have a question you would like to ask the candidates, please note which race you're asking the question of. And please be sure you ask the question in such a way that both candidates can answer it. Um, and we determined pretty much the order of opening and closing by a coin toss. So, I'd first like to introduce the candidates from the 16th Legislative District running for State Representative, Position 1, Maureen Walsh and Brenda High. So, I think we'll begin with you, Mrs. High, with your opening statement. Oh, I forgot to say the timer's right down there. She will hold up when you have a minute left and when you have 30 seconds left. Do you have to read faster? <laughs> and then stop. Do not stop mid-sentence. Finish your thought. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I timed this, actually. So. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, when I was told what I, that I only had two minutes to speak, I thought I'd better make this count and talk about something that's really important to me. Um, just a note, some of you may have read the Tri-City Herald that I'm ultra-conservative, socially and physically. Well, yes, I'm very conservative, but I wouldn't say ultra, I'd say passionately conservative. I love my country and, my, and I, I worry about it. On fiscal issues, our, our, our community, our state, and our nation need to stop spending. I think Marie and I agree on that. But we disagree on some moral social issues. I'm for choice, but my idea of choice starts before two people have sex. I love babies and can't even fathom the idea of hurting or killing one before they're born. Heaven help the society who kills their unborn because they refuse to take responsibility for their sexual pleasures. On homosexual marriage, on the, this issue I'll be on God's side. I believe marriage is ordained of God. If anyone wishes to fight against God, that is their choice. Individuals who disagree can badmouth me all they want on the issue and in the end, they only badmouth God. These two issues, abortion and gay mar marriage, is contributing to the breakdown of our families. I believe that the family is the fundamental un unit of society. Family is everything, and we are losing our families to the ideologies of liberals and progressives who want to destroy the family rather than build it up. In conclusion, I, I, I give a warning that the disintegration of the family it will bring up upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by prophets. We need to focus our lives on what's really important, for no other success from, can compensate for failure in the home. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Walsh. 
Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here, and thanks to all the sponsors. I won't try to list them all. It seemed like a long and extensive list. Uh, but it's nice to be here, and uh, I'm happy to answer the questions that you have. I've enjoyed representing this district for the last six years, and uh, frankly worked for 12 years prior to that also in the legislative environment. And so um, I've, I've met a lot of people, and I've learned a lot in my stint in the legislature, and still enjoy it enough that I would be uh, running again, <laughs> even in light of the fact that we've got a terrible budget deficit that we're facing, that we're going to have to really go back, roll up our sleeves, and try to get this, this train back on the track. Um, and that is going to take a lot of fiscal conservancy. I would agree with Brenda tremendously on that. I would also agree with her that I think that family is the basis of our society and probably the most important thing that we do in the legislative uh, environment is work with families and, and try to do what we can to help empower parents to be able to raise their own children, to be able to make sure their children understand and appreciate the value of the education that they receive in this country, and that we also uh, can assist our young parents because it's often a very difficult job when you have little children and you're trying to make ends meet and both parents are working. Our society is different now. We have different faces on our families. And I think that we have to, if in fact this is a country that is equal rights for all, I truly believe that we have to um, admire all families and try to do whatever we can to strengthen families regardless of, of what their makeup is. Um, I, I work for the Family Services, Children and Family Services um, in the legislature. I also am on the Human Services Committee and Health and Human Services Appropriations. I enjoy very much what I do. I enjoy very much. I'm very proud to represent this district. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I'm going to begin with what I suppose they call in the business a soft question. And as opposed to what I told you to write a question that both can answer the same or the same question, I'm going to ask a little bit different question of each of you. Um, in the Tri-City Herald, when, uh, after you met with the Ed Board, they had compliments for both of you. They talked about your strong suit, or one of your strong suits. And I'm going to start with you, Mrs. High. It said, she, Mrs. High, also has some solid ideas on how to reduce the state spending such as home monitoring instead of jail or prison time for low-level criminals. Would you please share with us more details on this idea and how, tell us how this could reduce state spending? Well, I don't know a lot about that a detail, except that I've, I've read from other states what they're doing to cut down on budgets for prison sentences. Instead of sentencing people who are not dangerous to you know, jail time, which takes up space, they're putting on these little bracelets and basically they're in, it's in-home prison. And they're not allowed to leave except when they call in to say where they're going and, and such. So I just thought it was a really good idea that maybe we can do something like that in the state of Washington, save on some, some space in the jails. What was the other part of your question? I don't that know was, if the, okay. how it would reduce state spending. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah, definitely would. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how much it is. I'm sure you know what the budgets are, but for each prisoner, it's, I think, $10,000 a month, but might be more, you know, to house them. So we'd save a lot of money, I think. Thank you. Okay, your turn, Mrs. Walsh. Same question? Nope. Oh. <laughs> they didn't say that about you. <laughs> Here's what they said about you. <laughs> Her service on the Early Learning and Children's Services Committee has helped pre-kindergartners throughout the state. It's a program that costs up front, but pays huge dividends down the road. So I'd like you to please explain in more detail what this program entails and how the dividends outweigh the costs. I have really, um, I guess I've drunk the Kool-Aid when it comes to the early learning initiative and what we've been doing in early learning. I think one of the best things we've done for a, a K-12 educational system that we have poured a lot of money into in the last couple of decades and really have not seen much return for that investment. It's been very disappointing. I think early learning, on the other hand, is where we're putting money. Yes, it does cost some money, just as good preventative programs typically do. But where we see the results is better uh, graduation rates for our kids, better behaviors when the kids get to school, 
sometimes just something as simple as reading to your kids 20 minutes a day, which frankly was a program that was begun here in the Tri-Cities and, and strongly advocated for here in the Tri-Cities, and the legislature has glomped right on to that, realizing the importance it is, uh, that it is. Interestingly, I had a Hispanic lady come to me and she said, I feel terrible. I can't read to my child 20 minutes a day because I can't read. And I said, put that baby on your lap, open up a book, and make up a story to the, to the book. And that at least instills in that child how wonderful reading is. And frankly, that 20 minutes of bonding, just having that baby sitting in your lap, I think is extremely advantageous. Uh, I've gone off on a tangent here, which I often do about early <laughs> learning, because I really do believe that it is one of the best things we've done for K-12 education. And I think if you ask a lot of our kindergarten and first grade teachers, they would say to you that a child that has had a good early child care experience and has gotten some of that assistance with um, their reading skills and their social skills, that they uh, frankly are far more successful in their early years of school and that seems to be carrying through their whole uh, academic career. Thank you. Thank you. You answered that. All right, our next question, and Mrs. Walsh, I'll ask you to go first on this. This is one that the audience submitted, plus we had that we wanted to ask also. The state budget deficit is currently around $5 billion. What is your plan for balancing the budget? Is your focus more on decreasing spending or increasing revenue? Please give us some specific examples. You know, I think just like any family in this state, we have to live within our means. And I think we've gotten to this point where the spending has really gotten out of hand. Are there some great programs that we've funded through our government? You bet there are. But can we afford them all? Nope, apparently we can't. And this economy has been a strong lesson to us that we really need to prepare for these downturns. And we have been had some cooperation with the majority party in establishing a rainy day fund, but it has been pouring. And that baby has completely been robbed by, by this point. Um, I do not believe in additional revenue raising, and especially in this climate. I think people are really struggling. And I know that when I hear from my constituents who suddenly are questioning what we're doing as far as social services to help our families that are in need, because they're hurting too. That's not the kind of environment we want to breed in this state when it comes to, to our social service delivery program. We want one that's efficient, and we want one where people really believe that they're helping those that are truly in need. And unfortunately, when the downturn in the economy happens, people are losing their jobs. People that have never stood in a food bank line before in their lives are standing in the food bank line. And when you have that attitude of resentment with your social service delivery system, then that's a very, very bad message to be sending to other people. Um, so I really do believe that out of necessity, the governor called for a 6.287 across the board cut for agencies. That's going to happen, folks. That's the reality of it. Nobody's going to get their pet projects this year. I frankly will not be very inclined to support the capital budget because it's money that I think we could use other places more uh, efficiently and more constructively, no pun intended. Um, but I, I really do think that we have got to roll up our sleeves, figure out how best we can do things in government. Maybe some things, functions do not belong in government. Maybe they belong in the private sector. I know that when we lose over 150,000 jobs in the private sector and we gain 8,400 government jobs in that same period of time, there is something very wrong with that picture. Thank you. 